along. It's great to see uh, so many people here today. Uh, as Bill said, my name is Becker. Um, I'm the uh, director of the ICT academic faculty. And this fine body of, of individuals is mostly sat here, uh, but we do have a, one or two scattered around. Uh, so in terms of uh, today's session, what I'm going to do is give you a bit of an overview of the AML discipline and maybe some of the hot topics and some key aspects of the program, which I think is you know, genuinely fascinating subject. Uh, and we'll talk about what some of the emerging trends are, where the program focuses, and talk a little bit as well about you know, what the benefits are of undertaking the program. Okay? Um, so in terms of, I'm just waiting for the slides to pop up here. Um, oh, I'm, I'm in control. Right, that would help. <laughs> I'm sort of looking blankly at the back there, but it's my fault. I do apologise. OK, so yes. Um, so let, let's look at this. In terms of the, the programme, we focus on uh, the AML discipline, focuses, I guess, on anti-money laundering, but also wider aspects, such as sanctions, um, which is, you know, incredibly challenging area. We're going to just touch a little bit on sanctions risk. I know many of you here will be, you know, managing sanctions issues, intrinsically linked to geopolitical events that are changing on a daily basis. And you, know, you would think it's very grey, wouldn't you? Someone is on a sanctions list, therefore we can't do business with them. But actually, sanctions is all about professional judgments and making calls in grey areas uh, and managing risk. You know, so we'll touch on that. We'll also, of course, talk about terrorist financing as well, which is, again, I guess, you know, almost intrinsically linked with anti-money laundering. And we'll look at the, the challenges that uh, organisations are facing at the moment. In, in all of those areas. So of course, you know, the term anti-money laundering has been with us a long time, and there is actually a lot of academic debate about where it originated from. And you know, there are, there's a school of thought believes it is Al Capone who did famously push a lot of money through laundrettes. And of course, the reason they got Capone was tax, wasn't it, as I think most people know. Now, I, my background is uh, I've worked as a money laundering reporting officer uh, and head of financial crime in various uh, regulated firms, but originally I started out in tax. And we do look again at the nexus between tax and crime. Tax is actually a very effective way of going after organised criminals. Uh, and they hate it, by the way. But you can raise tax assessments against drug dealers, people traffickers, and increasingly it's been used as a weapon. Um, so what, what I think is very interesting as well, when we go into the programme, we actually look at some of the latest uh, intelligence, some of the latest reality about how organised criminals are moving their wealth around the world. And I think, you know, for, for many people that I work with, they've been, they've really had the chance to step back and look at why we're doing this. You know, who are our enemy out there? You know, what, what techniques are they actually using? What techniques do corrupt politicians use to suck money out of developing economies? Where does that money go? You know, how does an organised crime group actually seek to legitimise its wealth? And you know, I've seen this in practice. You know, it's huge and it's everywhere. A lot of it is in the city of London, as you, as you probably know. Um, we'll be looking on the, on the course at some of the latest thinking about the techniques used. So many of you will have read about the, the case from a few years ago, which the press dubbed the Great British Laundrette. You know, dozens and dozens of front companies being set up in the UK, sham litigation, millions and millions of pounds washing through the city of London, but not just London, Manchester, Birmingham, a lot of it Russian organised crime. Uh, corrupt politicians coming through Russia, links to Moldova. On the course, we're going to look at some of the techniques. You've probably all heard the phrase front company. Um, most of you would be aware of terms like ultimate beneficial owner. Now, the problem is many banks, many financial institutions, they think they're dealing with one customer, but who's really behind that customer? And that is a hell of a challenge for all of us. Because we know corrupt politicians and organised crime, they use corporate structures to hide behind. They use nominee directors and nominee shareholders. And we know that the law and regulatory expectation has dramatically changed in this area. So the million dollar question is, in a regulated firm, how far do we have to go to know who our customers really are? How, how do we find the shadowy individual who's really controlling a, a corporate entity or has the wealth behind that entity? Um, you know, it's a very challenging area, very interesting. Um, the other area we look at quite a bit is, is the rise of, of terrorist activity around the world, and particularly terrorist financing. 
And we work a lot with law enforcement agencies on the program. Um, we have a lot of in-house experts on this field. Uh, and obviously, the rise of ISIS has changed the dynamic fundamentally. We know that historically, you know, traditional routes of, of fundraising in terms of you know, donations, non-governmental organizations, not-for-profit bodies, um, it is changing as ISIS raises the bulk of its money from territories which it controls, you know, in terms of tithes and levies on the local populace, oil, art and antiquities, and just actually looting, you know, looting bank accounts. We do know some money gets to them via, uh, you know, via donations and via fundraising, but that is actually a very small percentage. So the international community is wrestling with, at the moment with how do we tackle this? You know, and what role do financial services firms have to play in this area? You know, I work with a lot of banks, you know, who are looking at their transaction monitoring systems to say, how do we profile terrorist financing? You know, because someone goes on holiday to the south of Turkey does not make them a terrorist financier. But if someone goes to the south of Turkey and then their accounts go dark for three weeks, maybe that does indicate some you know, ul ulterior motive, some ulterior practice. Very interesting area. We look at the funding techniques and some of the challenges in firms for dealing with that, that approach as well. Now, if you look at this map here, we have the former USSR. We have, you know, a, a, a constantly changing um, structure in the world in terms of geopolitical uh, positioning. If you look at a uh, great example there, the change that's undergoing all over the world, Russia, Ukraine, the breakup of the USSR, all of these huge events have had a direct knock-on to the impact of the way transnational crime has grown in the past 15, 20 years, and the rise of regulatory responses and the expectations on all of us in firms to fight organized crime and terrorist activity. So we, we do look at the evolution of regulation, and as Bill's mentioned, you cannot be a practitioner, a professional working in AML, without understanding the global context so we will look a lot at best practice and emerging trends in other jurisdictions. And the ICA is unique in that regard because we see all the large firms, we train all the large regulators around the world. You know, Bill mentioned Moscow. You know, I've, I've trained the ru largest Russian bank. And of course, they themselves are now subject to, uh, you know, targeted economic sanctions. So a, a very important area of understanding this is also extraterritorial law. And I'm sure many of you, of course, know that we, we typically look, look across to our, our friends across the Atlantic when we talk about extraterritoriality. But of course, there are many, many other extraterritorial considerations that we need to think about. And I know a lot of you will work with organizations that operate you know, across the world in multiple jurisdictions. And that's one of the common questions I get. You know, how do I deal with conflicting law or regulations in different countries? You know, even little things like, I, I work for a multinational organization and a customer is residing in one country but they do an activity in another country. H how and who do I report that to if I'm suspicious? So we'll look at the sort of the conflicts and, and more importantly, the emerging best practices around the world. Uh, it's a very interesting sort of aspect of the course. Uh, Bill also alluded to the changing expectations around senior management. And of course, it's not just senior management. Um, I don't know if any of you attended the ICA annual conference uh, a few months ago, probably more than a few months ago now. There was a, a woman who was a former lead prosecutor at the FCA. She now works for a law firm. She was talking about, I guess, the exposure of professionals working in AML compliance. And there were grown men weeping as she was talking because it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, you know, the level of, 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 I guess, alarm in the room was palpable because her point was that you know, the, the, the risk and the expectation on all of us that want to work in this field is rising at an exponential rate. So part of, of what we're doing on, on these programs is giving you the tools to be an effective practitioner and to demonstrate your competence. Um, so, and, and what's worrying, when you look at thematic reviews like this one from the regulator, uh, you still see worrying levels of lack of competency, lack of knowledge, um, and, and, you know, and, and not just amongst rank and file people in firms, but people who are working as MLROs with just fundamental lack of knowledge. Now, you know, one of the things you'll, you'll find, and Bill's alluded to this as well, was 
The course is fantastic for helping you understand what good looks like, what best practice is. You will be in a room with 25 other practitioners from a range of industry sectors, some regulators, some law enforcement people, but it's incredibly useful to benchmark what good looks like. You know, I think professionally, what, what's helped me the most in my career is developing those professional networks, you know, talking to other practitioners. When it comes to AML, GRC, financial crime, you know, we do tend to share good practice amongst ourselves, you know, because we are all kindred spirits. Um, and this course will definitely help you understand those, those, those networks. So, in terms of the key AML knowledge that we'll get, the risk-based approach, I'm sure, is a mantra you've all heard. Uh, but we'll be talking about, you know, what is an effective risk-based approach? And we'll be looking at examples of people that have done it badly and how we how you actually do an effective risk-based approach. Risk assessment, very important, very key aspect of AML. New technology, fascinating area. So we work very, very closely with new technology companies. Um, I feel the need to show you a mobile phone. You all know what they look like, but these things have just revolutionized financial services. So we'll look at things like M-Pesa, which is sort of sweeping through Africa. Um, I've just got back from, I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying, I've just got back from a week training PayPal in Dublin. P PayPal is a bank. Uh, and, you know, they obviously are very cutting edge, and, and that, but they have a lot of risk in terms of AML, sanctions risk, etc. We'll also be looking at, you know, virtual currencies, prepaid cards. Um, and, you know, it, it's moving so rapidly that global regulation is struggling to keep up. Uh, we'll look at the vulnerabilities and some of the areas where there is movement as well in, in new technology. Um, the international regulation framework, I'm, you know, the more sad people amongst us will have been excited and thrilled when we finally got our fourth EU directive. Um, but of course, it's not just the fourth EU directive, is it? We, we live in a, in a constant tsunami of regulatory change. And one of the challenges is, is how do you keep your firm apprised of what's coming and position yourself accordingly? So we're gonna, we, we obviously, that's a massive part of the program, looking at where, where we're going with regulation on, on the course. Um, well, I wish I had more time to talk to you about this subject. My goodness, CDD, customer due diligence, beneficial ownership. The key focus here has been transparency. You know, we know that organized criminals, corrupt politicians, they don't walk into banks, do they? They, they, they send in front men, front companies, and they conceal their involvement. And, you know, the global community has try, is trying to respond to this threat, but my goodness, it's a war. It really is. And we're finding out, when we're looking on the course, at what good practice looks like in terms of you know, doing customer due diligence. One of the biggest um, changes I've seen, um, and I, I know Bill would agree with us, is we are training you know, in, in banks tens of thousands of relationship managers in AML. And historically, those guys, AML to them was seen as an annoying add-on to their role. They know now these guys, that it's a core skill. You know, and they know it's key. They don't want to do the wrong sort of business anymore. So you are seeing a fundamental shift in mindset, even in salespeople, if you like. And a salesperson's not a dirty term, but these guys are remunerated historically on bringing new clients on. They know now that doing CDD properly to the new expectation, uh, the new standards, is core to their role. And we'll talk about what that, that new standard looks like. This area as well, really interesting one. I, we get quite a lot of people who have not come from a, a trade background. So roughly 80% of the world's trade is done on what we call an open account basis, where you know, somebody's exporting goods from one country to another. And the only reason they would get a bank involved maybe is to effect a payment through, say, a SWIFT payment. Now, that scenario is exploited on a massive scale by money launderers, terrorists and corrupt politicians to move value around the world. Less than 2% of containers ever get opened and inspected in, in, a, in a big industrial port. So lying about what's in containers, faking paperwork, is how organized crime are moving value covertly around the world. 20% of the world's trade involves banks in a more structured way through documentary trade finance products. Some of you will be familiar with these products, letters of credit, guarantees, 
where the banks are reviewing huge bundles of documents. And the challenge is, how do you really know what the reality is under that transaction? So we'll look at that as well. Again, as Bill's alluded to, the, the qualification ranges from entry level right up to uh, our new postgraduate diploma that uh, I think Bill's going to be talking about later today. Um, here's just a very quick example. We will look at real cases of money laundering. Fascinating case, this. Um, Lebanese Canadian Bank. So very briefly, drugs originating from South America being exported into Benin in West Africa where the drugs are then smuggled into West Europe. So historically, a lot of the, the drugs coming into Western Europe have been through West Africa. Now, it is changing slightly. In the meantime, used cars being imported into Benin in West Africa, real used cars being sold on the street for cash. The drug money is then smuggled back after it's been sold in the streets in Europe, and our classic money laundering technique of intermingling is undertaken, where the proceeds from the car sales are mixed up with the drug money. Then that drug money is sent into informal currency exchange houses, black market unregulated exchange houses where you can get better rates than the official government rates. And these informal exchange houses have featured in money laundry schemes all over the world, most notably Latin America. Then these exchange houses had accounts with Lebanese Canadian Bank. That's how these properties are getting into the mainstream financial system. The, the risk here and the contagion is that Lebanese Canadian Bank also had correspondent bank accounts with main, main tier one financial institutions. So they were dragged into this as well. Then some of the money went back to fund more used car purchases. So this was a self-perpetuating money laundering scheme. The rest of the funds went to China where they were used to buy real goods, consumer goods, children's toys, electronics. Then they were shipped back to South America where they were sold in markets and that profit was then passed back to the drug dealers and that's how they realised their profit. That is a global money laundering ring which involves trade, it involves correspondent banks and banks and we'll look at the reality of this on the, on the course. Um, I'm conscious of time but you know, we have a range of different qualifications now, not just focused purely on AML. Bill's mentioned the CDD course, very interesting programme on practical customer due diligence. Specialist certificates in private banking, correspondent banking, and sanctions risk, and trade finance as well. So again, in the interest of time, you know, the CDD process, we, we look at this from start to end, and the interrelationships with other aspects of AML. Um, source of funds, source of wealth, very interesting areas. How far do you have to go? You know, we, we train a lot of casinos, land-based and internet. The big clubs in London, Mayfair, you know, they get Abramovich-level customers who will spend five million pounds a night. They have to ask the source of wealth question there. They do it over a cocktail. They'll get the, uh, the club manager to buy the uh, new customer a, a cocktail over the bar, and they'll ask them, you know, how have you made your, your money? I would love to be a fly on a wall on those conversations. Uh, of course, they verify it independently. Um, so, screening, adverse media, PEPs, these are all things we'll explore on the program as well. And you know, some of the, the examples we look at of bad practice are actually quite striking. Um, I won't go through this one in depth, but the, the gist is this, this, person, this, this, this person has been onboarded, a restaurateur has declared his income at around £20,000 per annum, and when the regulator came in and looked at the actual activity on that account, you know, look at this, you know, 1.1900,000 washing through the account in three years. That's a either a very busy restaurant, pizzeria or kebab shop, whatever it is, or something strange is going on, isn't it? And the regulator is still finding examples of firms not acting on this stuff. So sanctions as well. We do look at practical examples as well as theory on this course, really important. So this is an extract from a, a swift message. This was flagged up in a bank. Banks will have to deal with these. And you know the, the problem with this is this word here, Azam, which actually is, is the name of an Iranian vessel, which is on an OFAC sanctions list. Sometimes fairly innocuous things trigger these, these hits. What do you have to do to build an assistant to review these potential sanctions issues, document your decision, and decide whether it really is a true hit or not? And we'll look at that sort of stuff on the course as well. Uh, Okay, this are some glowing testimonials, and I know we've got Stephen who's going to say a little bit about the, his experience in a minute. Um, you know, people genuinely enjoy the course, and we get, we get fantastic feedback. So people enjoy it, and they get an awful lot out of it. I think that's probably all I want to say there. And again, 
Uh, unfortunately, Lee's not been able to join us today, uh, but we've got, as I say, the, the Illuminati set down here on the front row, uh, who are all fantastic trained. That sounds a bit sinister, doesn't it? I shouldn't have said that. Um, but but they are, you know, they're all fantastic trainers with a great wealth of industry experience, and you know, they're very engaging in, in the workshop. So I think you will enjoy it. Um, so that's probably all I want to say. I think I'm, I might probably run over for time. I don't know. But uh, shall I hand over to uh, Stephen? I think you were going to say a few words if I, if I can. So thank you. Uh, do you want to click if, if you want? It's up to you. I think you've only got one slide, haven't you? I don't know if you might. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Stephen McKellar. Um, I work in the EY for the Financial uh, Crime Advisory um, practice. Uh, I actually completed my diploma in 2012 and uh, for me it allowed me to progress within the industry that I worked in. I worked in electronic money at the time and for me it gave me practical skills that allowed me to go back to my firm and actually be use the benchmark best practices and incorporate them into what we did on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, also the benefit that it gave me was that it allowed me to progress quite quickly in that firm. It allowed me to create my own kind of role, uh, the training and the professional development uh, that, it, that I had allowed me to also move into consultant. So I moved from industry into consultant where the useful parts of this course are that it's the broad aspects as well. So you get to understand the various industries and the requirements and also you get to network with people that, that from those industries. So you get to understand the best practice for other industries, for your industry, you know what people are doing at that time and what actually works within your industry. What, what should you be doing? What, what are others doing? And also, I think the important thing is that's the way that regulators might perceive your firm as well. They will benchmark you to others within your industry. And I think it's a, an absolutely fantastic uh, course because for me, it gave me the confidence to actually take forward to senior people in the firm that I worked for uh, sign off on best practice, policies, requirements that that should have actually probably been there originally, but at the same time it allowed me to actually develop that framework, the whole AML framework, which then gave me that push to actually then progress my career. So, and also right now I'm actually studying the postgraduate diploma, so I've gone from the diploma all the way through. So I, I think for me it's the networking, the best practice, and that exposure to the technical knowledge, which I don't think you get anywhere else. That's, Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. So the checks on the post, mate. That's great. Fantastic. Uh, but you know, uh, that, that's, that's really helpful. And, and you know, we've got. If, if you do want to talk to um, any of the guys here, I know they'd be happy to have a chat with you. We've got. Um, and thanks again for coming, guys. Um, and just to give you a bit of an insight into the reality of train of, of doing the program uh, or doing the programs, you know. And I think that would be helpful. So it, I think we've just got a couple of minutes for Q and A. If anyone has any questions about the AML programs, uh, happy to field those now. Um, if anyone wants to raise anything. <laughs> oh, yes, we have one. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, quick question on the specialist uh, betting and gaming. Yes. Um, I, I read it's delivered. I mean, is this delivered with workshops or is this delivered online? What's the. Uh... Really good question. So the specialist certificates are available online, purely online, so you can do it effectively. Uh, through distance learning study. You can access all the course materials. There's webinars. We do what's called uh, integrated learning. So you, you have course manuals, you have webinars, you have further reading. You can interact with a, a dedicated tutor. And then at the end of it, when you feel you're ready, you can do the online assessment. But we also offer those programs on a face-to-face -face basis. So there'll be a one-day workshop and you can come along and again, interact with other practitioners in a face-to-face -face environment. So the answer is both options are available. And, and what we tend to do is we run the specialist certificates on a sort of rolling basis uh, throughout the year. And, uh, and also we do offer them on an in-house basis. So if a, if a firm comes to us and says, we've got you know, 15, 20 people we think would benefit from this, we can run it in-house as well. Um, does that mean that it's possible to run two programs at the same time? Then? So, for example, the specialist and one that goes. Definitely, definitely. So, they're designed to be more bite sized qualifications. I wouldn't recommend doing two diplomas at once. Uh, I think that would be, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, dangerous, for, uh, ill advised, ambitious. ambitious. Thank you, Joe. Um, but I think certainly a specialist certificate and a diploma, it'd be a lot of work, but it'd probably just about manageable. They're designed, really, just to so you know, the specialist certificates are designed 
for practitioners who've maybe been through, done other qualifications, and they want to expand their knowledge in a particular area. So for example, you've never had an exposure to betting and gaming or trade finance or correspondent banking. But they're also designed for people who actually work in that field as well. So that it's sort of you know, a, a dual approach, really. Um, Hi. As someone who's looking at coming to this field in a, in a career change, yeah. would you look at, in terms of the certificate and the advanced certificates, what would be your opinion on going in at, say, the it, different levels? Well, I think the answer is probably best if we have a chat afterwards, because it depends on, on A, your background, B, I mean, for example, some people that come into the program have never studied at sort of, what the, the, the diplomas are uh, graduate level courses. But you know, people come into that level, even though they've never worked in a, in, a, in a regulated AML role, and what we generally advise is we give them some additional support, um, and we, we, we maybe support their studies with a tutor, a mentor type person. It depends on A, your previous experience, your level of education, and your ambitions, really. So the answer is, if anyone's wrestling, and there are probably lots of other people wrestling with exactly that question, please grab one, either myself or one of the team, and we can talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis. We can try and give you our views on what, what level would be best for you. But do you know my honest opinion? If you're really torn, I would go for the diploma, because I think the diploma is the gold standard qualification, which is the sort of recognized, I don't know, pinnacle's quite the right word. Now we have the PG dip, but it's sort of the, 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 the gold standard. But yeah, let's have a chat, sort of one-to-one. -one. That'd be great. Uh, sorry, there's a question down the back. And there's a lady up here after that, Joe, as well, if we could. Um, there's a gentleman up here. How you doing? Um, Hi. I'm currently studying the advanced certificate. Yeah. Um, I've got an exam next week. Is Good luck. Is it a precursor <laughs> to join any of the diplomas that I've got to pass that? No. No, it's not. Um, so you look quite relaxed and confident, so I'm sure you'll be fine. Uh, uh, you do, I believe, Joe's looking at me here, you do get a, a partial dispensation, don't you? No, you don't. Forget, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. So that's totally rubbish. Ignore that. So. The answer is no, it's not a prerequisite. So by some catastrophe, you didn't quite manage to uh, succeed this time, you could go on and enroll. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. I mean, the, the majority of people that sit the advanced certificate do pass. Um, so you know, have you had your assignment result back yet? I don't want to get too personal in front of the room. But, um, so you know what you've got to achieve, don't you? So um, the short answer is no, um, and it will put you in really good stead. The, the, the qualifications are designed to be complementary. So, it, it, it really is going to help you go straight into the diploma because you've done the advanced cert. So I could, I could start the diploma irrespective of the results? Even if you're still waiting on the results, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, I have... It's here. Sorry, yeah. I lost, sorry. <laughs> I have a question on the workshop. So yes. Some, just for a reason, somebody missed one of the workshop because they're not in the country or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. It happens a lot, happens a lot. No problem. Two things I would say. Because we have such demand for the programs, there are usually a group of workshops running. So even if you miss one specific day, we, we'll talk to us and we'll see if we can get you to another date. Even if you can't do that, let's say you're on holiday for a couple of weeks or you're traveling on business, what, what we always say is, let us know, we send you a copy of the workshop materials and then we would arrange a, a, a phone call with a tutor to just run through some key points or any questions you had. So it's fine. It happens all the time. You can imagine, because the program lasts for nine to 12 months. So obviously, quite often, sometimes people have to go away, or it just can't be avoided. It's very common. And you know, obviously, it's very important you go to as many of the workshops as you can, but, but it happens. And you know, we absolutely can mitigate that. But can they um, attend in some other territory? Like, if uh, they miss in London, yes. can they go to yeah. Birmingham? Yes, quite, quite possible. Oh, yeah, definitely. Birmingham, all around the UK, they're running the same program. We could even, Michelle and Joe will kill me for saying this, uh, we could even probably, you know, for example, you're traveling in another jurisdiction and there was an ICA program running, we, we, we could get you along to that as well. But certainly it runs all through the UK. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of flexibility there. And, and I probably should say, not just in individual workshops, but quite often people are halfway through the program and something happens, momentous, like a life issue, life change, or work relocation, or key project. So we're very flexible about deferring the study, that sort of thing. Um, I think we're, I'm being told to, to bring it to a close there. If there are more questions waiting to be asked, you can always grab us anyway. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll perhaps hand back to Bill.